Hi, my name is Prof, and for my public facing file project for our Anthropology 205 course, I was interested in exploring the impacts that the increased demand for PPE, or personal protective equipment, has had on workers working in the glove manufacturing industry of Malaysia. This presentation will provide a brief analysis of the structural conditions and structural issues on the ground in the status quo that are being faced by foreign workers within the glove manufacturing industry of Malaysia. And these issues are more relevant and more apparent and therefore more impactful than ever as a result of the increased demand for PPE caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So this presentation will be in a rather loose form and more of a conversation where I explore the data I've collected and I explore the analysis, etc. Fundamentally, this presentation is divided into four major components as visible on this slide. The first is the introduction where I hope to explain why I chose this topic uh, why this topic is meaningful and why it's imperative or more relevant than ever to cover this topic, especially in our COVID-19 pandemic situation. Uh, I will also cover my, my personal motivations behind covering this topic. Then I'll move on to the methodology and data issues. So in that section, I will cover... Uh, the approach I use to gather data and gather information about this topic. And at the same time, I hope to acknowledge some of the failures while collecting the data and uh, try to transcend them uh, through the analysis, through approaching, a ra through approaching the analysis uh, with a rational approach. And in the analysis segment, I will try to give the data I've collected meaning in terms of a real world humanistic angle, as in what this data actually means for the foreign workers who I'm trying to represent and advocate for, hopefully through this uh, presentation. And finally, in the conclusion, I want to bring this presentation back to our core N205 concepts or the concepts that we have learned in this anthropology course, because the core concepts in this presentation will center chapter two uh, of the textbook uh, and will surround ideas surrounding capitalism, imperialism, and neocolonialism. I hope to conclude by bringing this presentation back to those core concepts, but we will explore tangentially different ideas before returning to these core concepts. Firstly, to introduce, what is PPE and how is it important during the pandemic? So PPE consists of multiple different layers of clothing or uh, equipment that is used in the fight against COVID-19. It's used primarily by healthcare workers and frontline uh, healthcare providers like nurses and doctors who treat COVID-19 and it helps protect them from the disease in the fight against COVID-19. It's incredibly important in the fight against COVID-19 because it ensures the survival of the healthcare workers themselves, right? And healthcare workers are the primary defense against COVID-19 in like the status quo outside of personal agency initiatives. So PPE involves multiple layers such as plastic gowns, uh, eye protection, respirators, uh, uh, foot uh, covers, uh, particular types of clothing. And, uh, but, but for this presentation, what we will focus on is nitrile gloves or latex gloves. The reason why we're going to focus on nitrile or latex gloves is because Malaysia comes into the picture by being essentially one of the largest producers of latex and nitrile gloves globally. In fact, if you look at the data, uh, Malaysia is responsible for 65% of the global supply of latex gloves and uh, nitrile gloves. So essentially speaking, 
uh, we're going to be talking about all forms of medical grade gloves, right? So any gloves that is used in a lab setting or any gloves that is used in the fight against COVID-19 or any other broad medical sense. If you see latex gloves or you see any sort of like those blue or black gloves, odds are they were made either in Malaysia, Thailand, or China, right? Because these three countries are responsible essentially for almost three quarters of the global supply, or in fact, almost 100% of the global supply uh, of uh, uh, latex gloves. And within that massive context, you have to understand that Malaysia itself is responsible for 65% of the global supply of latex gloves. As you can see in the diagram below the chart, uh, below the pie chart, you will find four corporations, right? Harta Lega, Top Glove, Kosan, and Supermax. These corporations represent some of the largest manufacturers of uh, latex gloves and medical grade nitrile gloves globally. In fact, Top Glove, the, the, the company with the logo in blue, is single-handedly the biggest single distributor and manufacturer of latex gloves in the world. How did I find out about this issue? Well, I was always aware of the importance of the latex glove industry to the Malaysian economy as someone who is very interested in business, finance, and economics. Um, the, I, I was aware of the importance of this industry to the Malaysian economy. However, what I was not aware of was the allegations of misconduct, uh, the mistreatment of workers, especially low-skilled laborers, and uh, the exploitation of laborers by proprietors of this industry, and generally this industry at large. And tangentially, the uh, the ignorance, or rather the uh, 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 going along with of the international system that relied on this industry or sustained this industry and allowed for these practices to continue en masse. So when I got to find out about this issue was actually earlier this year when there was increased scrutiny on the supply chain in Malaysia by international bodies due to the increased demand in PPE. Because as the demand in PPE increased, uh, other nations suddenly required a massive uh, uh, increase in gloves, right? They, they, they demanded more gloves. And what occurred was journalists began to look at the industry itself, right, which was booming as a result of this demand. And what they found was that a lot of the corporations at the top of this ladder, at the top of the latex glove ladder, were responsible for providing really horrible conditions for workers and allowing for conditions almost equivalent to like modern slavery to occur within factories. And there were many allegations made of things like debt bondage, uh, poor living conditions, etc. And this is how I got to know about this issue. Why I chose to cover this issue, on the other hand, is because even before I found out about the specific instances of misconduct, etc., I was aware of the fact that, as you can see in the diagram, right, as you can see in this chart, that the proprietors of these corporations were actually becoming incredibly wealthy from the sale of uh, latex gloves as a result of the demand caused by PPE. In fact, if you look at the chart, right, in the first half of 2020, Top Glove, as I mentioned earlier, the biggest single manufacturer of gloves globally, and Harta Lega, which is the second largest, right, both gained between 240 and 137% increase in stock price. So as we all know, a lot of billionaires, they don't actually have cash on hand. Their wealth is intrinsically tied to corporations and the stock prices of corporations. So as a result of this sudden increase in demand and the rapid increase in the stock price, uh, 
what occurred was there was a rise of the PPE industry where the pandemic, the suffering of the global marketplace and the suffering of the global population actually resulted in several billionaires who had not previously been billionaires being minted within a span of five to seven months. Uh, and this was as a result of the surge in stock prices due to a surge of the virus, right? A surge of COVID-19. This led me to believe that there was a serious injustice, right? Because if at the top of the ladder, the owners of the corporations are doing so well, why are the conditions for their workers so terrible? The exploitation is problematic. And I felt like there had to be something done about it. I don't expect there to be much done about it through this presentation, but I thought at least I should talk about it. The reason I think that is, is because it comes down to a point of national pride for me because I'm a proud Malaysian. And to see, to see the exploitation of laborers at this scale occurring in my country makes me embarrassed to be Malaysian. It makes me embarrassed to see that the government isn't doing enough to protect poor people, to protect vulnerable people. And I think more should be done. So, yeah, that's why I chose this topic. So moving on, we're going to talk about the methodology I used uh, to gather information and some of the tangential data issues I might have faced while gathering data. So in terms of my methodology, I had three layers of uh, data collection or information gathering. The first was a survey that was sent out via a primary contact within one of the factories, a Hartalega assembly line manager. And a, I sent out a Google form to uh, these workers and uh, uh, via, via this contact. The survey was available in five languages, uh, English, uh, Bahasa Malaysia or uh, Malay, uh, which is also understandable to people who speak Indonesian. Uh, the survey was also available in Bengali, spoken by Bangladeshi citizens, uh, Burmese people. Uh, the, the survey was uh, also available in Burmese. And the survey was also available in Tagalog. Uh, the reason the survey was available in these languages is because these different language groups uh, are tend to be the largest proportion of foreign migrant workers in Malaysia. So the biggest groups being the Indonesians followed by the Bangladeshis, followed by the Burmese and uh, the Filipinos. So I, I was trying to be more inclusive with the survey and to, be, uh, to, to allow more people to understand the questions fully. As part of the survey, I also used a lot of uh, diagrams for those who were less literate. Uh, so it, it would allow them to comprehend the survey a little better. But in terms of possible failures within the survey, because this is the primary source of data that I use to analyze the situation within the factories, I think one major uh, issue or rather unintended consequence was the fact that my primary contact was actually a Bangladeshi man. And as a result of me sending him the survey, a lot of the respondents, te respondents tended to be his friends and his roommates, etc. And as a result of that, a disproportionate number of them, a, a disproportionate number of the respondents were Bangladeshi instead of a more representative population more representative and diverse population of uh, the factory workers themselves. But that being said, uh, in these factories, Bangladeshis, uh, Bangladeshi workers actually tend to be overrepresented. Uh, 
despite the fact that they are not actually the biggest foreign worker migrant group in Malaysia, that that position being held by uh, people from Indonesia. On top of the survey, I also uh, interviewed my contact, who I met through a friend who works at uh, the uh, who works for Harto Lega, uh, James. Not not his real name is a Bangladeshi assembly line manager. And it's through him that I actually sent the survey out. I actually interviewed him uh, as part of this project. He did not allow me to record it. However, I did uh, take a lot of notes surrounding his like opinions and the anecdotal evidence that he offered. And I believe that this evidence is incredibly valuable to the conclusions that I intend to draw from uh, this project. Beyond that, uh, a major source of information was also the investigative journalist reports that actually uncovered the story. This story by uh, Jonathan Miller is one of the first uh, pieces that I actually read about this issue. And it's the first piece that brought this issue to my attention. And so it holds a special place in the scope of this project. So in terms of analyzing the actual uh, results of my information gathering and the data that I've gathered, we'll start with the survey. So the survey was actually opened on the 18th of November uh, on 2020, and it closed on the 2nd of December 2020, uh, both being Wednesdays. And so the survey was open for approximately two weeks. There were 66 respondents, 48 of whom were eligible for my survey, the remaining being either Malaysian citizens who I was not, uh, uh, I was not trying to cover within the scope of this presentation, or they were, um, they were foreign workers who were not on the assembly line itself. And I was more targeted at the low skill, low paid positions within the factories, which occupy the majority position. They are, they are the, the majority of the hired workers of these uh, employers. So I, I wanted to cover these uh, individuals as opposed to the, uh, as opposed to the uh, higher paid middle income individuals who did not work on the back. So in terms of the nationalities of the workers, as I mentioned earlier, there were a disproportionate number of Bangladeshi respondents. However, uh, as I also mentioned, uh, this isn't too far from the reality. As we can see here, the over like 64% of, uh, of my respondents were Bangladeshi, but in fact, if you look at the factories, it might be closer to 50, 55% of the employees being of Bangladeshi origin. And the remaining workers uh, might be of Indonesian citizenship or Burmese citizenship. I had one or two Filipino respondents and I had one Vietnamese respondent. Most of these workers also carry a valid work visa uh, in fact, 94% of them had work visas. Beyond that, most of the workers are between 18 to 30 years old, uh, and a small minority of them, around 10%, are between 30 to 45. No, almost none of my respondents, in fact, are over the age of 45. Most of the workers work for Top Glove or Harta Lega, uh, some of the workers work for other smaller glove manufacturing corporations like Brightway, Kosan, CE, Comfort. So uh, this is like the distribution of the workers. Finally, most of the workers had worked for a, pe for a very short period of time. Most of them had only spent between one and three years at the factory. All, none of them had spent less than a year, probably because of the pandemic, there was probably no hiring this year since March, probably. And as a result, there were uh, probably uh, very few or no workers in that one to three year category. This can also be attributed to the fact that James 
the, the, the primary source of distribution is actually a senior or relatively senior individual within the factory or uh, on the assembly line. And therefore his uh, roommates or friends or co-workers uh, that he knows personally might be of uh, a slightly longer, might have spent a slightly longer period of time working for this employer. But that being said, there were a small uh, minority of individuals, 16.7%, who had worked for three to six years, and an even small minority had worked for six to nine years. This represents the fact that a lot of these companies have a high turnover of these low-wage worker and workers or low-wage laborers, right? They turn them over very often, like they might fire them and hire new ones very often. Um, in terms of union unionization, none of almost none of these workers belong to a union. In fact, if you look at the yes uh, data, right? which is less than 7% of the respondents. When I looked at the data, most of these respondents were actually slightly more senior or in managerial positions rather than working uh, directly on the assembly line. They, they, they were in charge of more assembly line workers. So unionization was not common at all. In the second section of the survey, I want to find out the difference in workers' conditions or workers' lives before and after COVID. So the point at which COVID became a big issue in Malaysia and when we started to have quarantines and lockdowns and started to feel the global impacts of COVID and the stretches on our supply chains was actually in around March 2020, the beginning, in fact, the first week of March. So I asked the workers uh, what their wages were before and after March 2020. So before March 2020, wages were anywhere between 1,100 and 3,400 ringgit, right? However, the 3,400 and 1,900 ringgit these are more inclined with senior positions or more senior positions within the factory uh, workflow. Uh, and most laborers actually fell into two categories. They either earn 1,200 or 1,300 ringgit. This is actually the minimum wage of Malaysia. In fact, Malaysia's minimum wage is around 1,200 ringgit. So some people were getting less than the Malaysian minimum wage, which isn't a lot to begin with because the Malaysian minimum wage is around 200 to 300 US dollars per month. So these individuals who are working on the factory floor were earning somewhere between 200 and 350 US dollars a month. Keeping in mind that one US dollar is around 4.13 ringgit or Malaysian ringgit, um, these individuals actually saw an increase in salary after COVID hit. However, the increases themselves weren't particularly significant because they saw maybe 200 to 300 ringgit in increases, anywhere between 40 and 60 US dollars. Not particularly significant when your wages are very low to begin with. I also wanted to find out if there was an increase in working hours before and after. So what I did find was that before COVID, most of the workers were working somewhere between 54 and 60 hours per week. Keeping in mind that most workers work a six day work week, which is quite common in a factory setting, right? That usually operates on a 24 hour shift cycle. These workers were working between nine and 10 hours per day. These are a lot of working hours, but nothing compared to what they were working after COVID, after March 2020, right? Because what we saw was there was a drastic increase. The lowest amount of hours these workers were working was the highest amount of hours they were working pre-COVID, right? So these workers were working anywhere between 60 and 84 hours per week. 84 hours is 
working 12 hours per day, seven days a week, right? So individuals were working seven days a week without taking a day off and working for up to 12 hours. This is, this is probably horrendous, right? But what's more interesting beyond this actual increase in working time is the fact that the workers are receiving somewhere between 10 and 15% in raises, as mentioned earlier in the wage uh, charts. However, they're seeing up to 30 to 35% increases in working hours, right? So the, the working hour to wage increases does not co correspond to each other in a meaningful way. This does not make sense and speaks to the exploitation that these individuals are facing in these factory environments by their Finally, I wanted to find out if the workers perceived their compensation as being fair. And what I found was that these individuals pre-COVID, pre-March 2020, actually felt like they weren't being well compensated. In fact, over 66% of them, nearly 67% of them felt like they were not fairly compensated before March 2020, with around 18% being unsure whether their compensation was fair or not, and around 15% feeling as if their compensation was fair. However, after March 2020, this proportion shifts drastically. For some reason, a lot of individuals feel as if they are being better compensated than before. However, as I mentioned earlier, the wage compensation to hours work does not necessarily correspond in a fair or equitable manner. These individuals are actually working longer hours or less. However, they perceive uh, uh, the wage increase to be better compensation. They feel as if they're being better compensated because we see a decrease in respondents who claim that they are not being fairly compensated. And we see an increase in respondents who, who feel like they are being fairly compensated. Beyond that, I also wanted to find out about the health and accommodation of the individuals because I had read before in a lot of the journalistic pieces, uh, especially the investigative journalist, journalistic pieces, that the accommodation and health requirements of these plants was atrocious. Like the conditions were very terrible and not particularly conducive to like human living. What I did find was that in terms of COVID tests, a lot of individuals, in fact, a vast majority of individuals were tested between one to three times per week. However, uh, nearly 40% of individuals were never tested per week with a very small minority of them being tested between four to seven times per week. This goes to show that despite the fact that these workers work in close proximity of each other in areas where social distancing is not particularly easy or doable, that these employers are not testing their, their employees on a regular enough basis to accommodate the fact that we are in a pandemic world right now, in a pandemic situation. Beyond that, I also wanted to find out if the employer provided personal protective equipment for the employees themselves to improve the likelihood that they would not catch COVID. And what I did find was that most employees did provide a reasonable degree of uh, personal prote uh, protective equipment in the form of rubber gloves, probably manufactured uh, domestically, uh, face masks and hand sanitizer, and some some employees actually went further in providing face shields. Um, in terms of the accommodation of these individuals, most of them, nearly ninety six percent of them, actually live in employer provided accommodation. That means the employer actually provides them with hostels or some sort of accommodation where they can stay when they're not working. What was interesting was how many people lived in this accommodation. In fact, if you look, and the numbers are wrong here, right, 33.3%, right, in brown, the, the, the number there is wrong, 
but 33.3% of the individuals who uh, live in employer-provided uh, accommodation actually live uh, in a dorm-style hostel or a dormitory where 24 people live in one room. And in the purple section, that actually represents uh, the number of people who live with 10 or less people. So what we found was that nearly 34% of individuals live with 24 other individuals in the same room. So in these rooms, they are not, it's not easy to social distance when you're sharing your room with 24 other people. And this was a situation in these employer provided accommodation. Beyond that, we also noticed and we can see that a lot of individuals, in fact, 67% of them do not feel like they have adequate accommodation. And that's probably because most of them live in extremely crowded dorm dorms, right? Uh, at least 80% uh, of them, or nearly 80% of them, live in dormitory situations of 10 or more people, with an, a, a possible 34% of them living in dorms with 24 or more people. So this goes to show that the situation, despite the COVID pandemic, right, is not being taken care of, right? Uh, employees are not being provided with accommodation that is suitable to the pandemic situation. They're not able to isolate themselves. They're not able to quarantine themselves properly. And this is why these dormitory situations, these accommodations where uh, foreign migrant workers live has become a hotbed of COVID clusters in Malaysia. In fact, almost all the COVID clusters that have occurred have occurred within these dormitory situations, within this uh, these confined spaces where foreign workers live. In my interview with James, we touched on a lot of the issues that were being faced by his workers, right? His friends, his colleagues, and the people who live with him. And the number one issue that James told me about was the fact that uh, the accommodation was terrible. It was bad before COVID, but in that COVID lifestyle, living in a COVID world where isolation was necessary, quarantines were necessary, what James complained about most was the fact that uh, he was living in rooms essentially with bunk beds and there would be approximately 14 or 15 bunk beds in one large room and basically individuals would share these large rooms. Uh, possibly like 20 to 25 people would be sharing one uh, toilet and one bathroom and there may not be a, a kitchen provided for them to uh, do cooking. They might be cooking on an open flame uh, in an exposed gas burner or uh, they might have rice cookers on the floor. It, and they lived in these very cramped and confined spaces. He said he was very concerned that uh, he was going to catch COVID because he was living with almost 25 other people. Uh, beyond that, he also complained about the working conditions and the fact that his employees and the people who worked under him were being increasingly forced to pull 12 and 13 hour shifts uh, without the adequate compensation. And he complained about that a lot. He said that if that continued, he was, go he was concerned that he was going to see a lot of employees uh, mm -hmm. take drastic steps, right? Or, or, uh, uh, or expire from, from uh, exhaustion right, of working for these long hours. Finally, I want to analyze the investigative journalist reports about the situation within uh, these factories uh, and the impacts it's having on the migrant workers themselves and the exploitation that these migrant workers are undergoing uh, under this uh, leadership, under the uh, employers, right? So what... Uh, Many of the investigative journalist reports found that migrant workers were paid 
somewhere between one pound and eight pence per hour for 12 hour shifts, six days a week. And many of the workers were clocking nearly 111 hours in overtime, which is, by the way, a breach in Malaysian law. They were top love, one of the major antagonists within this context, the biggest and most profitable glove manufacturing corporation in the world, by the way, was making illegal and very petty deductions from workers' salaries for arriving 15 to 20 minutes late to the offices, uh, to the factory uh, floor. Uh, Conditions, by the way, that were necessary as many of the workers had to uh, stand outside the factories to uh, get their temperature taken. And they had to queue for long periods of time. And they were actually having their salaries deducted as a result of having to queue. On top of that, uh, Top Glove also reported a 366% increase in quarterly profits because of PPE demand. So they're taking all these exploitative steps and performing all these exploitative activities while at the same time increasing their financial uh, uh, benefits, right? They're increasing the financial remuneration. They have increased the stock price, etc. Most of the workers were of Bangladeshi, Myanmarese, or Nepalese uh, origin, and they were of uh, they were living in cramped and squalid company-run hostels. What this looks like is uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is the if you look at the diagrams, you can see those bunk beds, uh, which are honestly very atrocious situation, living situation. On top of that, you can also find that many workers. Were, pay, uh, were, were struggling to pay extortionate recruitment fees because what happened was uh, in their home country, they might have paid a recruiter up to 5,000 US dollars, right? Which was like loaned money to try to uh, move to Malaysia to get a good job, but they were still strapped with this debt burden. And so they were bonded to the recruiter uh, with the money that they owed the recruiter. On top of that, uh, many pay slips also, as I mentioned earlier, saw that many of the workers were clocking in over 111 hours. And uh, yeah, the situation overall was quite terrible. In terms of concluding, I want to try to understand how this has happened. What went wrong, right? Why are these workers being exploited? And I think anthropologically speaking, from a decolonized... So to conclude, I I kind of want to bring it back to chapter two, which is discussing a legacy of imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism. But it's important to acknowledge the reason why a lot of these individuals are leaving their country in the first place and are therefore being, uh, uh, you know, exploited, right, is because of a legacy of colonialism. In fact, a lot of these individuals come from countries that were historically colonial countries, right? Bangladesh and Myanmar were historically British colonies. And then you have the Philippines, which was historically an American and previously a Spanish colony. Then you have Indonesia, which is a Dutch colony. A lot of these people and the land was exploited by their colonial overlords and the remaining regimes and nation states that were left behind to rule were not conducive to social mobility. These nations are rife with social problems and and, and issues that are associated with a legacy of being exploited, right? You have corruption, pollution, uh, a lot of these issues that have made it difficult for these individuals to achieve social mobility without leaving their country. And this is a problem because when they leave their country, they're bound, a lot of them and many of them are bound to be exploited by unscrupulous business owners. This leads me on to how this new neo-colonial era has formed, right? While Malaysia is certainly a key state or key actor in this supply chain of exploitation, 
it's important to acknowledge that at the end of the day, Malaysia is supplying these gloves to a lot of first world countries, right? It's supplying these gloves to Australia, Canada, uh, the UK, France, Germany, a lot of uh, quote unquote first world well developed countries. And in a way, many of these countries are complicit. And this is the problem because what's happened is there has been a shift of responsibility. So what is essentially happening is a lot of first world countries are allowed to get away with these exploitative practices because they are not directly participating in them. Instead, they are complicit, right? So they avoid the responsibility that they might have once had if they had been more active perpetrators of this uh, negativity. But it's important to acknowledge that in this complicity, they are part of the process of exploitation and therefore they have to take responsibility for the issues uh, that are occurring here, the exploited, exploitation issues, not only within the glove industry, but a lot of other industries, uh, especially in the production of goods, right, that occur globally, right? And this comes down to the issue with capitalism as a whole, right? Because capitalism is about accumulating profit, accumulating wealth. And so long as there is no social agenda or that so long as there is no sufficient political will to challenge this issue of greed above utility or greed above uh, empathy, this system will continue to be pervasive. And this is the system that needs to be challenged. We need to dismantle the structural issues that have been caused uh, by this neo-colonial, imperialist, capitalistic mentality. We need to give better options to individuals. We need to give more, uh, uh, we need to give people more options of social mobility. And we have to have a more ethical mentality towards consumerism and uh, the, the, our participation in the supply chain. Thank you for listening. I understand this has been a very long presentation. I try to cut it down so much. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And I apologize again for how long this